The following program is a SUTV student production. The views expressed are not necessarily those of Salisbury University, the University System of Maryland, its regents, administration, officers, employees, or representatives. All right, we're sitting here with former delegate Mike Schmiegel, who's running for the first congressional district seat. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Eli. First, tell me why you're running. Uh, I'm running because I'm unhappy with the representation we're getting out of Congress currently. You get people, they promise you all the right things and they do all the wrong things. And I spent 12 years in the Maryland House of Delegates and I was proud of the fact that I was able to maintain my principles um, without giving those up um, and still be able to get things accomplished. You can reach across party lines, you can accomplish things, but unfortunately today too many people put their party ahead of principle or they put their uh, politics over the people and that shouldn't be the way it is. So I, I'm running to go in and to make sure that the promises that the things that I hold as principles are kept. Um, you want smaller government, you want to make sure that your veterans are taken care of, you got to take care of making sure that ISIS and terrorism is addressed. Um, personally I feel our borders have got to be closed that they, uh, in order to protect against uh, what is happening in the country with uh, people coming in. And it's also a threat to our national security with the uh, possibility of terrorism coming across the borders also. And so the national debt, how is anybody going to be able to, uh, my children, my son just graduated from the school um, recently and my daughter is going through college. How are they gonna be able to get jobs on the Eastern shore or in Maryland and be able to stay here with the amount of debt that we currently have, trillions of dollars. And so we have to stop that spending and get responsible uh, with regards to the monies. The current congressman goes in and promises to do one thing, he does exactly the opposite. He promised, you know, he'd stop Obamacare. He voted the fully funded. He promised to stop illegal immigration and he voted for the executive uh, amnesty that was given by the president. And even with tuition, like at this college, you know, the congressman has voted for in-state tuition for illegal aliens. That means that a Maryland student whose family paid taxes, that student was raised here, misses a spot when they wanna go to a state university because that's being filled with somebody from outside the country. When I was in the Maryland legislature, I voted against that and I said, even if you can, if you're gonna do it, at least do it with spots that are saved for people from outside the state. Use it for um, outside positions for the illegal immigrant who's getting the in-state tuition. They wouldn't do that. So that means that my son, your son, or somebody else's daughter who meets the grade, gets straight A's, may not be able to get into a state school because they had, and so that's where I think I differ from the current congressman with respect to that. I didn't vote for that. I voted against it, worked against it. And um, I, th I think that integrity means something. And I was in the United States Marine Corps since a young man. Um, you take an oath to uphold the Constitution and you uphold all of the amendments to the Constitution, not just some of them, the ones you like. I always say I'm as liberal as the Constitution, I'm as conservative as the Constitution. And so I've done a lot, the marijuana bill. I worked across party lines with Heather Missouri. We were able to pass that and to make it decriminalized. And what we were able to do is say that if somebody gets caught um, and they're underage, they get a fine and they go for medical treatment and care as opposed to treat it as a medical, but don't put them in jail, don't give them a record, don't keep them from getting a job, and to treat it differently. So you can reach across party lines, maintain your own principles. I reached across party lines with Heather on another bill that uh, stopped 2,000 abortions a year and it reduced the infant mortality rate in the state of Maryland by 24% in just three years. So you can hold your own principles, reach across party lines, and still accomplish things. They don't do that in Washington, D.C. right now. And that's one of the things I want to go in and make sure it's changed, is that we go in and you fight the farmers uh, on the Eastern Shore. They need somebody to make sure they look out for them. I got 100% rating with the Farm Bureau. I got 100% rating with the National Federation of Independent Business. And if we make sure that government gets out of the way and stops trying to run business, stops trying to run the farmer, let them free enterprise go and let the idea of capitalism work, they'll do just fine and we'll have jobs for everybody. Well, you touched on a lot of national issues yes. that, you're fo that you would be focusing on. Talk to me about some of the issues that you would try to uh, move forward or, or work on that are specific 
to the district, to District 1, and, and to those that live in the eastern, on the Eastern Shore? First thing I would do is the Congressman just agreed to take Maryland, Maryland Department of the Environment out of the mix on being able to determine the um, effluence coming through the Conowingo Dam. It's at the head of the bay. So we've got all of these phosphates and nitrogens and sediments that are coming over the bay whenever their Hurricane Sandy comes through. There's a huge uh, flood of water and all of these items go into the bay. They destroy, they lay down a sediment that destroys the oyster populations and destroys billions of dollars worth of cleanup that we've done. Let a farmer have a cow get too close to a stream and the EPA's out there hitting it with all kinds of fines. We have Exelon Corporation, who runs the bay, is the congressman's fourth biggest contributor. The congressman decided that he would side with Exelon over the citizens of the first district in making sure that the bay was protected and that we made Exelon go in. They're, they want a 40-year extension on their agreement to run this uh, hydroelectric dam. Tell them to clean up the catches behind the dam, which are full of all these sediments make that part of the agreement, clean up the mess. Instead, he said, we're gonna take Maryland out of the mix and not let them even have a say in what's going on. Why would you side with Exelon Corporation over the people who live in this district, who work, use the bay, the watermen and others who use it? It's wrong and that is a perfect example of putting politics over the people and the people are interested in what's going on in the bay. So there's one very small instance of something that I would do immediately is to make sure that the Bay and the issue with Exelon, that they took care of getting rid of those sediments behind that dam to reduce them or come up with a plan over the next few years to reduce them so that next time that there's a Hurricane Sandy, like uh, I believe in 2012, that it doesn't come down and pollute the entire Bay and wipe out the billions of dollars that we're being asked to put in and cleaning it up. Well, let's talk about the politics of it. Okay. For one, why do you think you can win? Why do you think you can beat the incumbent congressman? Well, we took a poll and we said, if people know about his actual voting record, will they vote for him? And overwhelmingly, you had 80% of the people, he co it comes out and the congressman says you know, that he is um, this big pro-life person. Well, we actually voted in the Cromlomus bill to expand federally funded abortion. Now, you could be for or against abortion, but you should at least state a position that's consistent with the way you're gonna vote. So you can't vote to expand abortion and then actually go out and uh, say, tell everybody that you're against it. It's wrong. He, he criticized Congressman Gilchrist and said that he was uh, too uh, pro-abortion. He criticized uh, Congressman, uh, excuse me, Senator Pipkin when he ran against him and said, oh, he was. Well, he went and did the exact same thing when he got there. I went into Maryland, um, into the House of Delegates, and we had a horrible situation in Cecil County with an abortion clinic. And I proposed, even though with the Democratic committee, I proposed that we could come up with solutions to, and, and said, you may be against abortion or for abortion. I may be um, in one position, you may be um, pro-choice, I'm pro-life, but we all can all agree on one thing. The woman should live through the process. So we came up with a set of suggestions that you treat them like medical centers, that the doctors, that they would be checked to make sure that everything was appropriate, that the people could not begin a procedure out of state and move them here just because Maryland had um, laws that allowed something to happen in this state that couldn't happen in Jersey or elsewhere. And we were able to put those proposals up and to get them accepted they went to a study and came back, and we have the first regulations on abortion, abortion clinics in the state of Maryland ever. So there's a way you work across party lines. You agree, we're gonna disagree, but can we all agree that somebody should live through this process? And by doing so, we were able to reach across party lines and get something done that actually fixed a part of the problem to make sure it's safe for women if they have to go there. So there are things you can do. Again, maintain your principles, you didn't give them up, but you can reach across party lines and get things done if you're smart about it. You don't have to go and lie to the people and say, this is my position, and then vote the exact opposite way. In, in Maryland's General Assembly in particular, you do a lot of times have to work across party lines to get things done, and that is yes. something you have done. But do you think that has been a detriment in any way? To me? To you. Yeah, to my own party. My, you know, um, often, I, I go by the theory, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or you're a Republican. If you are saying something wrong, if you're being a hypocrite, you point them out and call them out. 
it is absolutely wrong for the Republican Party to say that we want the federal government to recognize state rights. And so we tell the federal government, we say, uh, we, the federal government has to allow the states to make the decisions when it comes to, um, we'll say, uh, the, the states' rights issue where the um, Republicans say that they want the states to make those decisions would be, well, they don't want them to make it when it comes to gay rights. They want to say, okay, we'll make that decision. They don't want the states to make the decision when it comes to uh, abortion rights, well, you can't have it both ways and say that uh, you want states' rights in some issues, but you don't want it in others. It has to be it is or it is not a states' right issue, and that's part of the problem is the hypocrisy. And you need to point them out right now with the Second Amendment issue in Maryland. If it was a Democratic governor, I guarantee you that all of the leaders of the various gun organizations would be arguing that we need to permit to carry, and they'd be pressuring it. But because now we have a Republican in office, we have all the people who say they're for the Second Amendment, the leadership of these organizations, not going and saying, Governor, we want you to do something. The very same things we'd be asking a Democratic governor to do. So I, I would say the hardest part is when you go in and you maintain your principles and you say the Constitution's your guide. And again, I don't care if, if it's a liberal view or it's a conservative view, stick to the Constitution. I'm a libertarian. And that's the view that you should follow. And whether it's a Republican or a Democrat who's buying off of the path of what the Constitution lays out, you need to call them out. I guess my question is, though, aren't some of those libertarian values, don't you see them as potentially harmful in this Republican primary? Well, it's interesting, because even though the congressman is voting in a very uh, establishment way with Republicans, he goes and doesn't miss a chance to say, oh, I'm part of the Liberty Caucus. Now, you can't be part of the Liberty Caucus and vote for Obamacare to fund it. You can't be part of the Liberty Caucus and vote for um, illegal amnesty being granted, uh, amnesty being granted to illegal immigrants. You can't be part of the Liberty Caucus and vote to expand federally funded abortion. All those things are anathema to what the Liberty Party would be saying that they stand for, yet the congressman wants to wrap himself in that now because he sees what's going on. Um, when I was in the House of Delegates, I was the chairman and the founder of what we had called the Tea Party Caucus at that time. And we had said we are going to agree that there will be no um, earmarked uh, bond bills. We're not going to say that a bond bill should be given so that I want to get your vote on something I give you $300,000 to bring home and do something special. We were able to take care of those things when they needed it. We had a home for children who were handicapped, and what we did was put it in the regular process. We held public hearings. There was a debate. When the debate was done, there was a vote. The vote said, yes, this is an important thing. We'll make it part of the budget, put the money in. It worked in that process. But the bond bills, you put in a bill, and at the end they say, well, I'll tell you what, we get your vote on this, I'll give you that 300000 to take home. I get your vote on this, I'll give you that. So the Republican caucus said, we're not going to do any of those. They signed a pledge. Half the members right away started doing them, including the leadership. I said, it's hypocrisy. You can't say, I'm not going to do this. Go out and stand in front of the TV cameras and say, we're going to stop this. And yet, at the very same time, be doing what you said no. So in the um, Tea Party caucus, we said, if you want to main, main a member of the Tea Party caucus, you cannot, on this fiscal issue, go out and say, no bond bills, and then put them in. So the first year, we had 22 members, and at the beginning of the next year, we only had 11, because 11 members wanted to put the bond bills in. We said, we're not going to let you remain a part of this and claim that you espouse these virtues when, in fact, you don't. And that's the problem with the congressman now. He, ex he claims that he's a liberty person, yet he's voting with the establishment. So I don't think it's going to hurt me in this race, at least against him, and I'll be glad to when the you know, if we get through the primary to bring these issues up and I'll stand on my principles with a Democratic challenger or a Libertarian challenger. Let me ask you this, two, two parts. What do you say to someone that said you were better positioned, you had a, a larger pulpit when you were a sitting delegate to run for this seat? And two, someone who said, look, you didn't make it through the last primary, you know, for a, a lower level mm -hmm. office. What makes you think you can win this one? Well, 
you have to know what happened last time. We, they, we got gerrymandered. They changed our district. And so in my district, they took 3,000 people who were Republicans, and I'm very proud of the fact that Mike Miller pointed me out and said we want him gone. So that means I was doing my job if I was a big enough thorn for Mike Miller to notice. So they took me out. They took 3,000 people and moved them to the bottom half of the district. For years and years, as you know, Carol count, Caroline County did not have anybody in representation. So they added 3,000 Republicans down on that end. They had somebody run. The way that it runs there, there are three, one person ran in each district, um, in each county. You can only have three winners, but no two can be from the same county. In my county, there were four people running, and in the other counties, one. So I had three challengers. I lost by 144 votes. So taking 3,000 votes away and having to beat three challengers before I even got out to run against the other three, I didn't find that to be any kind of a problem. It, it's no reflection on my uh, service there. Um, I had a very effective 12 years in the Maryland House of Delegates, and um, I think that those very same things that I achieved there in the Maryland House, I will take to Congress, and I'll achieve the same. What's more important than how you sit there and press the button at the end of the day, green or red, is whether or not you're willing to stand up and fight for those principles that you have. And so I've shown that uh, I will not only, I'll lead the fight, I'll stand on the principles, and it doesn't matter if it's a governor, is a Republican or a Democrat who's yelling at me to change my vote. I'm not gonna do it if it changes the principle. So standing on the principle, yes. Do I have a problem right now with the uh, uh, party saying that we're gonna rally behind the incumbent even though he is establishment and voting against what any one of them, every meeting I go to, I stand there in a room full of Republicans. Is there anybody in this room who would vote for Obamacare? Not one of them raises their hand. Would anybody in this room vote for, and I go down the whole list of all of the things, anybody vote for the highest increase in the history of the United States? Congressman Harris did under the column of this bill of 2014. Not a single hand's raised. And then I look out to him and say, then why would you be enablers of an establishment politician who votes for the very things that you say you're all against? They'll do it because they're safe and, well, we won't change, but we just don't need to change our guy. We do need to change your guy if he's not voting the way you want. And so you can, as I've said, accomplish things. I'm proud of the fact I've got more bills passed working across party lines. Um, getting the marijuana bill passed you know, was a decriminalization of it. I think it was a good thing. The congressman's position is that he thinks that the federal government should run, and that's another one of those issues. It's hard, to, how can you say you're for states' rights when you want the federal government to say no to marijuana everywhere, and he wants to tell D.C. that they can't have it. Now, I know they're not a state, but still, they had a 70% vote of the populace to say we want to decriminalize or legalize marijuana, and what have they got now? Because the congressman butted in, they can't tax it, they can't regulate it, but it's legal. So they got the worst of both worlds. And so I think you need to be able to have the gravitas to stand up and fight for the things you believe in. It's not just enough to press the right button. You gotta stand up and you gotta lead others to come around to your point of view and defend the positions that you believe in. And that's one of the things that I'll do. Nobody's ever questioned whether or not when I tell you I stand for an issue or am I willing to defend it and explain it. When I first came out years ago, 10 years ago, and I was for the medical marijuana, I had friends that were um, on the Christian right in the churches that we were at come to the public libraries when we had our hearings and say, well, how could you be for legalizing this? You're gonna have crime in the streets and it's gonna be a problem. And I'd explain that, you know, this is about grandma in a wheelchair who's dying of cancer and the government has no right to interfere in her quality of life. That's between her and her doctor and her God for the last six months how she's gonna live. And if marijuana smoke will open the esophagus and a pill won't do it so that she can eat and be, have a better quality of life that last six months, who am I in the government to interfere? This isn't a gateway drug. Grandma's not gonna be on smack in six months. So grandma's might be alive in six months. So these are life and death issues for a lot of people and the government should stay out of your life. I believe smaller government, the less government, is a better government. Government has a purpose, and that's to protect us from foreign invasion, to make sure that when we have commerce overseas, that, that commerce is fair. You can't have Virginia having an agreement with France on how they'll sell things uh, different from the agreement that Pennsylvania has with France. You have a federal government makes treaties and, and deals with those things. That's another issue. Shame on every member of Congress 
who didn't have the guts to stand up for the Constitution when it came, the president said, I'm not going to enter a treaty with Iran. Iran's going to get the bomb. And why are they going to get it? Because the president said, I can't get a treaty pursuant to the Constitution. I don't want to be able to have to go through two-thirds of the Senate approving what I decide to do. So I'm just going to enter an agreement. I'm going to call it, uh, we'll, we'll have an agreement. The Senate and the House acquiesced in going around the Constitution by the executive and doing this in an unconstitutional manner. Yet now they stand out there disingenuously and say, look at this horrible agreement. You let it happen when you fail to stand up for the Constitution. You take an oath to defend the Constitution. That means if the president himself is going to violate it by entering into an agreement that is outside of what the Constitution allows because it's not a treaty, then you stop it. And it was up to the Senate to do it. And then when the House said, we're okay, Senate said, we're okay, as long as we get a vote. So on that, I think a lot of, a lot of Congress, a lot of members of Congress on the right would say if they could do something, they would have done something. What, what are you saying you would have done in that case? Well, I'll tell you what I did when Martin O'Malley uh, um, violated his authority. Martin O'Malley used his executive authority to say that I'm going to say every daycare provider in the state of Maryland has to join a union. So you have somebody who has a private daycare and if they take a purchase of care voucher for poor children. So there's children whose parents can't afford to pay $500 a week. So the state and your taxpayer money pays like 250. The only requirements are that it goes to a house that's safe, that it has the appropriate amount of parents or adults per children, and the governor can regulate those things to those people who receive that purchase of care voucher. What the, Martin O'Malley did was say, you know what? I'm not only going to regulate the person who gets the voucher, I'm going to regulate the person who owns the home, that private enterprise. And I'm going to say they have to join a union. And all of them have to join a union if they want to get this purchase of care voucher. I sued him. I took him to court and said this is unconstitutional extension of his powers. And any one of those people in Congress could have done the same thing when the president exceeded his authority. You have to stand up and fight for the Constitution. I fought for the state's Constitution, and I thought it was wrong. What was the end result? We won below at all the courts, and we got to the highest court. And the highest court said, because of the politics that are involved at the highest court, that, okay, it was okay for the uh, governor to do this. Do you know what the end result was of that? Now, those poor children and those families don't have as many choices to go to because the parents who owned the daycare facility said, I don't want to join a union, so I just won't take a purchase of care voucher. Sorry, poor children find a place that will. So the result of his interfering with the private enterprise was to deprive children of an ability to go to a place to actually get care because he wanted to do this for a political ends of trying to give the union something, giving them mandatory memberships. And they should have fought against when the president tried to do this so that he could get this treaty done with Iran so he could have a legacy. They should have stood up and fought. There is something you can do. No is easy, yes is hard, you need to get the yes. And so if defending the Constitution, you swear an oath to do it, you find a way to do it, but you don't acquiesce in it. So, so let me ask you uh, two parts to that. For one, we're sitting here January 2017. What is top priority for now, Congressman Schmeagel? Top priority right now is protecting this country. Immediately um, get those borders shut down, um, make sure that I, go th I would go to Congress when, when, talk to me specifically about what you mean when you say get the border shut down. I would make sure that the borders were protected so that we could not have people infiltrating us, whether they just be illegal immigrants or they be um, OTMs other than Mexicans, people coming in from other countries that mean to do us harm, ISIS, um, other terrorist groups coming across our open borders to do us harm. There are many ways that you can do it, and one of the, one of the easiest ways I do while they're building the wall is I would move military bases along the border where we have a tanks, we, t we test our tanks right now up in New Jersey, we have a place. Why would you not go out into the desert where we're going to be using our tanks uh, in battle, which we currently do, and put a place that you test uh, tanks 400 miles from um, a uh, border and then 400 miles away? Well, we test drones. We have drones out there, so 400 miles away, you put a place that's going to be testing drones. 400 miles down from that, you maybe want to test helicopters. Now you've got 1,200 miles of border where you have military installations every 400 miles 
that are doing something. And you have people working to build that wall to protect the South from an invasion uh, coming up, whether it is an armed invasion or it's just an invasion of numbers. It's still an invasion coming into our country, and you need to stop that. I have no problem with immigration. That, and, and we're all immigrants. And yes, it should be an illegal process, and we should be able to vet the people coming in. If we can't vet the people by being able to look and find out what their history is and whether they're a danger to the United States, then they need to be put in a place where they're safe if they're refugees, but they're not going to endanger the American people. So that is a major uh, concern. And what I would do to take the fight to ISIS is what the Constitution says you do. You go before Congress, you make your case, and you say, Congress, I w uh, you know, we need to address this issue of whether or not there should be a declaration of war. And if the Congress finds that there is a reason to have war declared against those who have declared war against us and are launching a war against us here in the United States, if Congress does that, then you ask the President to take that to the Joint Chiefs of Staff to come up with a military plan to defeat them and get the politics out of it and leave it to the generals. I was in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, I have every faith in the military hierarchy being able to do what's necessary to protect this country. Get the politics out of it. The Constitution lays out the method and let our generals take care of the, that. Well, again, you and you yourself spoke about some of the dysfunction in Congress and within both parties. How do you get that done, especially as a first-term congressman? Well, you stand up and you make the point. Sitting there quietly waiting for your turn to speak or waiting for whether or not they'll give you a nice position. I don't care if they stick my desk in the hall and tell me that I, I, I don't get to sit on any committee. I'm going to go down there and maintain the principles that I'm espousing here today. I'm not going to change my view once I get there. I'm not going to have somebody tell me, well, we're going to give you a nice cozy job and a nice cozy room. All you have to do is agree to just wait and we'll tell you what it is we're going to do. And that's what they've done. They've changed the way the Congress works. Do you think there's no member of Congress now that shares those views? I think there are many that? that do. I think there are many, just not enough. It's called the Liberty Caucus, and those who actually do it. You, you, you know, Justin, um, uh, um, I want to say Amas, uh, um, Justin Amas. Um, you know, I like Rand Paul. Um, there are people down there that are doing the right thing, and I think that we need more of them. And again, it's the Constitution. You know, you all the answers that you need are you know, written in your constitution, and follow that. That's all you need. You know, and it is a document that has lasted the test of time, and I haven't come across a problem yet that the constitution hasn't been able to address. Okay, let me ask you finally, is there anything you'd like to add for the students, the viewers, the voters of District 1? Well, the students, I, I think, take a close look at what you're being told. I put in bills to make college cheaper by saying no tax on textbooks. It makes no sense to me to say we want to make college cheaper for students, yet we're going to tax their textbooks. And I put it in every year. But now you're hearing from people who come in and, you know, Bernie Sanders comes in and says, I'm going to make college free. Everybody gets it free. You know, and as I explained to my daughter, I said, well, where do you think the money's coming from? Do you understand what socialism is? It's not a dirty word. It's an actual actual political thought and they say give me 90 percent of everything you make and i'll give you free health care i'll give you free college but are you free you're going to be giving 90 percent of everything you make every hundred dollars you get you get ten dollars from so while it seems enticing to somebody who's going through college and has the bills i mean and so you understand i work midnight to eights um, I was in the Marine Corps. When I left the Marine Corps, I went to go to college, and I worked in a commu community college as a Marine recruiter, uh, working out of the community college. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I went to a four-year school. I worked midnight to eights in a mental institution um, uh, during the night, went to school during the day, got my four-year degree. And then when I went to law school, I worked at a respite care center with people who had mental health problems, and I worked in the, with the criminally insane. And so I worked a full shift the whole time I was going to school, it doesn't mean that everybody has to do that, but you have to have the opportunity to do that. And I think it means more to be able to give the opportunity to people in college to be able to, you should be able to work here on campus and to make enough to be able to pay what you are being hit with with a college bill. 
but your college bills go higher and higher because of things that really have nothing to do with get, you're getting your education. And so if we get government out of these public processes, um, allow the free enterprise system to work, it's going to uh, be a much better way than making the promise that just vote for me and I'll take care of everything and I'll you know, pass legislation that's going to give you everything for free. And I think that that's a real dangerous thing right now. And I, and I was amazed at you know, talking with some people in school and they tell, oh, we had a rave the other night for Bernie. And I was like, you had a rave for Bernie? You know, and sit there and try to understand, do you understand at all what his philo political philosophy is? And it's okay, I give him credit for this. He tells you straight up what his political philosophy is. I don't like the person who doesn't tell you what their political philosophy is and tries to sell you one thing and then does another. So whoever it is that you decide that you want to pick, make sure that you, know, you understand what it is that they're offering and vote for that person because you agree with those principles. Um, I grew up believing this was the greatest country on earth. I owed it something. I joined the Marine Corps to, when I was young to pay that back. Um, best thing I ever did, I learned discipline. Um, I learned a sense of uh, patriotism and that I had an obligation to the country. When I went into law, I didn't go into law to make a million dollars. I went in to be a champion for people who were looking for somebody to help them when they uh, ran into a problem. A lot of the stuff you can look in the phone books I put was government misconduct. You know, when there were, I've represented the police officers for many years uh, in the police union. Um, and so I think it's important that you have a well-rounded background you understand what it's like to earn a dollar. Um, nobody handed me nothing my whole life. You know, you work for what you get. And if I go to Congress, the only thing I'll promise you is I'll make sure that your future gives you the same opportunities that my future gave me. And that we don't promise you anything for nothing, but we promise you that there won't be any impediments to your being able to achieve what you want. That any man or woman who says, I want to do something, has the opportunity to do that. You should have the opportunity to go to school. You should have the opportunity to exceed into anything that you want. My job is to clear that road, to make that path available, and to make sure that it's not, government doesn't build jobs, government creates problems. Get government out of the way. Let the free enterprise work. The only time government has to get involved is when there becomes a monopoly, something becomes too powerful, it's oppressive, and we have to make sure that uh, there's actually true free enterprise, that people, people do have an, an option and have an ability to work. And so we don't do things to put up hurdles. We actually put up things to build bridges so that people can uh, get through. And again, I welcome anybody from anywhere in the world who wants to come to the United States, but it's a melting pot. You learn the language, you learn about the history, you come to this country and you become part of this country. You're an American, not you come to this country, you bring your flag, and you say, change your ways, and we don't have enough tolerance. That's my biggest thing, is, is when I see people and they get upset about um, somebody saying a prayer on a public grounds, and say, nowhere in the Constitution does this idea of separation of church and state exist. That was from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist, and he explained the idea. What it, the Constitution says is, you shall not promote or prohibit any religion. So if I'm at a function and a person gets up and says a prayer, being tolerant of that person, if they're a Muslim, if they're a Jew, if they're a Christian, if they're a Hindu, being tolerant goes a heck of a lot further than saying nobody gets to do what they want. I learn more by listening, talking to them, and experiencing it. And it becomes part of that American melting pot. And I think that's what we have to do, is open ourselves back up to being tolerant of others and expecting them to accept those principles that we hold here in America. We hold freedom. There, nobody should come here and say, you're gonna accept Sharia law. That's anathema to what we believe in. We have a rule of law, and shame on any politician anywhere who says that's something that we should accept. So to me, um, the most important thing is making sure that we're tolerant when we go in, 
and that we allow people opportunities, we get the government out of the way of those opportunities, and you fight for the things that you believe in. You don't sell out, you don't uh, spin it, say what you believe in, explain it. One of the things, if you come, we're holding across the state, we have um, currently town halls. And if you come to my town hall, I'm gonna answer your question that you stand there and raise your hand directly. Go to Congressman Harris's town hall. You get to write down what you want. You hand it to somebody on the side. They take a stack of them and they decide which question the congressman will get. That's not open access to the person who represents you. For the entire time, if you look on the Constitution I gave you earlier, my cell phone is there. The pens that I give out, my cell phone is on. I've given out my cell phone number for the 13 or 14 years that I've been uh, involved uh, in government and the 12 years that I was in the Maryland House of Delegates. Everybody has my cell phone. So I don't ever have to worry about going into a meeting and having somebody say, I couldn't reach you. Because I say, people can reach me all the time. And anybody doubts it, it's 410-920-0128. 410-920-0128. You can reach me 24-7. And you'll be able to reach me when I'm a congressman, 24-7. Because I believe I'm there as an extension of the people here. I got 100% rating with the Farm Bureau. I got 100% rating with the National Federation of Independent Business. Because I understand what they need to go forth and, and, and prosper. I got an A plus with the NRA. Um, I'm proud of the ratings I got. I got the Defender of Freedom Award, and I got the only A++ from the Oath Keepers for keeping your oath to the Constitution. The only one in either the Senate or the House that they ever gave is the A++. I got the highest rating they have. And that's because you place the Constitution first, and let that be your guide. You'll never go wrong. And so that's what I would say is you, my promise is that I will keep the Constitution first, and I will be available and accessible for anybody who wants to reach me. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank to you very us. much. I appreciate it. Thank you.